Hi everyone and welcome back to the Fusion Industry Association. My name is Sid Cowley. I'm a PhD student studying at the University of York and working on diverter plasma physics at the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy. Today is Friday the 26th of August and I'm very pleased to give you your weekly Fusion News update. Stories today include 1. Ignition confirmed in nuclear fusion experiment for the first time. 2. Meet Copernicus, TAE's planned billion-degree hydrogen boron nuclear fusion reactor. 3. Surprising attractiveness of hurdle to developing safe, clean, and carbon-free energy. 4. Nuclear power's biggest problem could have a small solution. And, of course, as always, we'll have some bonus stories at the end as well. 1. Ignition confirmed in a nuclear fusion experiment for the first time. I am so incredibly excited to share this first story with everyone today. So many people in fusion have been looking forward to this moment for so long, and now that it's here, it almost doesn't feel real. The moment is that ignition has finally been achieved for the first time in a controlled nuclear fusion experiment. But let's back up a little bit. What is ignition in the first place, and why do we care about it so much? Well, an ignited plasma is a plasma where the power produced by fusion reactions is sufficient to continually heat the fuel and overcome the energy losses. Essentially, it's a plasma where most of the heating comes from the fusion reactions rather than external heating sources. Ignition is defined by the Lawson criterion, an equation or set of equations that relate the fusion reaction rate to the power losses for a plasma of a given density, temperature, and energy confinement time. Now, for those of you who watched our summer episode last week and have been watching for a while, you'll remember that pretty much a year ago now, the National Ignition Facility in the US achieved a record-breaking 1.3 megajoules of fusion energy out of a single fusion target. Now, scientists at this facility, which uses short bursts of high-power lasers to compress a fusion fuel target, have been analyzing those same shots from last year. And just recently, three amazing papers were published in Physical Review on that experiment. One by Critcher, which describes the design of the experiment, one by Zilstra, going into the experimental data, and one by Abu Shwareb, showing the presence of an ignited plasma. Now that ignition has been demonstrated in a controlled environment, does this mean that fusion reactors are ready to put energy on the grid tomorrow? Have we solved fusion? Are we ready to pack up our stuff and go home? Well, not quite, particularly since the National Ignition Facility has struggled to replicate its highest gain shot of 1.3 megajoules last year. What this piece of news does mark, however, is a key step in progress towards commercializing fusion and an incredibly exciting transition to a regime of plasma physics where the fuel is mostly self-heated. As we transition to this regime, there is a plethora of unknown and exciting physics to discover. In fact, Omar Hurricane, a lead scientist at the National Ignition Facility, said that it is extremely exciting to have an existence proof of ignition in the lab. We're operating in a regime that no researchers have accessed since the end of nuclear tests. And it's an incredible opportunity to expand our knowledge as we continue to make progress. Two, meet Copernicus, TAE's planned billion degree hydrogen boron nuclear fusion reactor. The second story today comes from Interesting Engineering and covers TAE Technologies a private fusion firm and fusion industry association member aiming to generate energy using hydrogen boron fusion reactions. The primary benefit of using this fuel mixture is that it's aneutronic, so it doesn't produce many neutrons, which are usually harmful for the surrounding material. The main challenge to this hydrogen boron approach is that to efficiently fuse those two nuclei together requires incredibly high temperatures. This article reports that TAE's current demonstration device, Norman, successfully achieved a plasma temperature of 75 million degrees Celsius, which is more than two times greater than what Norman initially aimed to achieve. Now, the company has secured investments of $250 million in its latest round of funding, with backers such as Google and Chevron. The round of investment will fund the initial construction of Copernicus, their next generation reactor, which aims to maintain a plasma temperature of nearly 100 million degrees Celsius. To put that into context, that is incredibly hot. It is more than six times hotter than the core of our actual sun. 
Three, surprising attractiveness of hurdle to developing safe, clean, and carbon-free energy. Our second story is a great technical piece from physics.org and focuses on a phenomenon in fusion plasma known as locked tearing modes. Now, tearing modes are instabilities that exist in tokamak plasmas that are usually caused by plasma resistivity or the ability of the plasma to resist the flow of electrical current. And this resistivity can lead to changes in the magnetic field profile of the plasma. In particular, tearing modes can lead to magnetic reconnection, where magnetic field lines which were locally disconnected can reconnect, forming loops of magnetic field lines called magnetic islands. The growth of these islands can lead to significant energy leakage and can be harmful to the performance of a plasma. However, these modes can occasionally stop rotating and lock, hence the term locked tearing mode. When locking occurs, the tearing instability growth rate can increase significantly, leading to sizable heat loss and can even cause disruptions. Because of this, present day devices tend to stabilize these instabilities by injecting microwaves before the modes lock. However, this article from physics.org covers some really interesting findings from the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory on the possibility of stabilizing these modes before they lock, not after. This is primarily because injecting the microwaves to stabilize these instabilities is not very efficient when the modes aren't locked. So when they are locked, we can get increases in efficiency for the stabilization. Additionally, in future devices such as ITER, which are much larger than today's devices, it's predicted that modes will not grow as fast after they have locked, which allows more time to stabilize the modes after they've locked, in contrast to current day devices where as soon as these modes lock, you're in trouble. This reversed counterintuitive method of dealing with lock modes is one which needs more experimental study, but it does have a lot of potential to increase the energy efficiency of future devices. Four. Nuclear power's biggest problem could have a small solution. Our final story today is a great overview piece on the spherical tokamak. For those familiar with our channel, you'll know that a tokamak is a donut-shaped machine designed to confine and stabilize a fusion plasma using strong external magnets. But not all tokamaks are designed the same. And one key feature of a tokamak's design is whether a tokamak is a standard aspect ratio, where there's a great deal of space in the core of that donut, so it's more like a bicycle tire, like this, or whether it's so-called a spherical tokamak or a spherical aspect ratio. And that is more bunched up, there's less space in the core, and it looks more like a cord apple than a bicycle tire. The primary benefit of a spherical tokamak is that it can lead to much better confinement than a standard aspect ratio tokamak for the same price and size of the machine. Sir Stephen Cowley, head of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, which is home to the spherical tokamak NSTX upgrade, said that the technology of being able to get everything down the narrow hole in the middle is quite hard work. Since this central column needs to house the current carrying magnetic coils, along with appropriate heat and neutron shielding and cooling if superconducting coils are used. However, places like Princeton in the US and Cullum here in the UK are researching how to cope with the challenges of spherical tokamaks. Princeton, for example, has been developing high temperature superconducting coils custom made for the central solenoid in spherical or tight aspect ratio devices. Right, well, that's it for our main stories today. Uh, for our bonus story, we have a roundup from Fast Company on the front runners of the private fusion industry, including Fusion Industry Association members, such as TAE Technologies, Helion, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, and Tokamak Energy. It's a great piece if you're interested in the private fusion sector, just to understand who the main players are. Right, well, that's all for Fusion News this week. I really hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please feel free as always to leave a like, comment, or subscribe to the channel. Uh, we really appreciate the uh, support you guys give this channel. As always, if you, any of these stories interested you in particular, their links will be in the description below. And we also have our Fusion News Extra podcast where we take a deep dive into these stories. Thanks for watching.